still mean leaf. Um, my topic is the conversion from soil to hy hydroponic production in protected cropping. It's a bit different to what has normally been done before in that usually they compare field to hydroponics, but this is actually comparing soil growing greenhouse production to hydroponic production. I'd like to thank Horticulture Australia Limited for allowing a refugee like myself this opportunity to travel all across the world. I live in an area called Virginia. It's about 35 kilometres north of Glenelg. As you see, very high dense greenhouses in this area. They're all like my father. About 20, 30 years ago, he arrived in Australia as boat people. Um, in, in leaky boats too. Um, they all started in Sydney, Melbourne, and they heard these Greeks and Italians were making very good money in this area. They came, and that was the advent of plastics in the industry. So they all went and built these large greenhouses. Each one of these greenhouses, probably, it's only a small family. So they're all family businesses in this area. It's not a lot of big investment. Okay, so a bit of history. 20 years ago, my father came to the area. He was one of the very first Vietnamese in Virginia. So we've been growing in the soil for 20 years. We grew tomatoes, capsicums, and cucumbers in greenhouses very similar to this. They were, they were built from the 1960s, so some of them are 50 years old. They were built by the Greeks and Italians. You can see um, very low gutter heights, about two and a half meters. No ventilation, no climate control uh, glass. In 2007, oh, what's it? All right. before 2007, we had two and a half hectares of these basic glass houses. In 2007, the government decided to build a nice fancy highway straight through our property. <laughs> That's a really nice bike track too. <laughs> that left us with a very, very, very big problem: is that 7,000 square meters is not enough to sustain a family in the soil. So what were we to do? I, at the time, was living in Sydney and my father called me and asked me if I wanted to go home and start a business with him in hydroponics. So yeah, definitely I came back. In 2008, we built our first greenhouse. It was a medium tech plastic, three meters to the gutter. There was no heating, very basic ventilation, and we aim for summer production. In 2009-2010, we built our second greenhouse after I came back from Europe. It's high tech, five meters to the gutter, polycarbonate, which means we don't have to worry about hail, strong winds, rain anymore. So basically, based on a Venlo type greenhouse from Europe. Today, 2011, we rebuilt that first greenhouse to be similar to the second one, so they're both five meters. We recently installed a 2.8 megawatt coal boiler, just in time for the carbon tax. <laughs> <laughs> We're soon to have a recycling system, which means we'll have very limited runoff water to the environment. And now we go for all year production. Oh, just, I just like to say, my brother, he installed that by himself. Yeah, but he got to go to China and buy it too. <laughs> <laughs> we only grow, at the moment, we only grow trust tomatoes. Um, last year we tried capsicums, but it failed. Very <laughs> bad. Basically, this is our farm here, and when you talk about salinity, we, we, and, or we dose at three, three ECs. So three, I think, um, gravitational decimals. This will be the same three. 16 degrees, 5.6 pH. And it's kept like that all the time. So study topics. What are the benefits to converting to hydroponics? Why would a girl take that plunge? The capital cost for technology? What the difference between low, medium, and high-tech glass houses? And how can these different forms of reduction achieve growth goals? Last one, limitations on the industry. In the Virginia area, can the people sustain this technology? The question I pose is, is our method truly hydroponics? There's been a very big misconception about hydroponics recently. We, people seem to think, oh, you know, what do you do? I'm a council, what do you do? I'm a hydroponic grower. Oh, really? 
How big is it? Is it in your little shed? <laughs> It's still media based. The system we grow in, typically tomatoes, it's still media based. So sometimes we use coconut husk, but usually now I grow in rock wool, which is molten volcanic rock, which is heated up and spun into little fibers. So it looks almost exactly like installation, house home installation. It's very clean, that's why we, we use that. We use a dripper system. We use a dripper system, so it's almost like growing in little tiny pot plants. That's, that's how I, I think about it. If you get a pot plant, put inside your house and water it, almost the same. This is a true hydroponic system. Whereas water, nutrient-rich water, runs through these gullies, and the plants are almost dip directly into the water, and that's where they get their nutrients from. So if you think about hydroponics, this is the true meaning. My style, it's really called soilless production because we don't use traditional soil. The soil production in the Virginia areas started in 19, around the 1960s. And the greenhouses now are about 50 years old, and they're still growing them, which means the soil is 50 years old. Short crop of tomatoes. A tomato usually is a seedling for three months. We harvest it for another three months, so six month production. Two, two production a year, so two seasons a year, which means there's pretty much, there's no fallow period because greenhouses are typically small. If you don't have a crop in it, you don't make money. Which increases the risk of pests and diseases. Because we're continually using the soil every year, pests and diseases, they can live in the soil for a very long time. Especially diseases, very bad diseases like canker, phytophthora, fusarium. Um, sometimes in this, in this kind of production, you can't see it because the crop won't get it for at least three months. But by that time, you're halfway through your season. So you just chop it down and start again. I just want to kind of say that I'm not against the soil. I'm not against the soil, even though I'm a hydroponic grower. I grew in the soil all my life. I still think you can get excellent quality in the soil. The yields are very good. It's cheap. It's very cheap. I mean, the, you can build a half, half hectare greenhouse, and my vents, the vents on my greenhouse are the same as building a whole greenhouse, just for the venting system. Really cheap. It's a very good way for young growers to get into the industry. Less labour involved in the soil. Much about, apart from weeding, I had nightmares about weeding when I was young. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've touched the weed in three years. Less risk involved. If you screw up a crop, at least you can start again. And most importantly, especially for our area, is the lifestyle. Many of the farmers are refugees, immigrants from overseas. All they want to do is make a little bit of money, buy a house, send their kids to good schools. Um, you know, just have fun. So that's very important question. That's very important for what, what I'm studying. So why convert if the soil is still very good? Why would people convert? The hydroponics is one of the fastest growing industries or agricultural industries in Australia. In our area, about 5% of growers are converting every year. They're mostly in those low-tech glass houses, greenhouses I've showed you before. They have very advanced irrigation systems like this one from Holland. This year alone, I've probably sold seven of these. So seven new farmers this year alone. They've got no climate control systems, no recycling of wastewater, which means any water that goes in comes out straight into the environment. Production is limited to temperatures, to water quality, in Adelaide, we'll have 45 degree temperatures and there's just nothing we can do about that, even in high-tech greenhouses. This is a typical low-tech, what we'll say low-tech greenhouse, like the one before, converted over. You can see very low gutter heights, two and a half meters. This is a crop that's being pulled out. So this is very typical of what you can find in, in Virginia. Whereas this is a high-tech greenhouse that you'd find pretty much everywhere else. That yeah, only Virginia grows in those two <laughs> greenhouses. <laughs> Everywhere I went, Poland, Germany, UK, France, J northern Japan, I didn't get to go to because of the earthquake. Um, Singapore, USA, they all prefer to grow in these greenhouses. Um, on the Growth Focus program, we went to oh, USA again, France, Ukraine, Bahrain, and Turkey. This is a four hectare um, or farm in France, southern France. This is in the Ukraine that we were on the global focus. They wouldn't let us in. I predict it's about 10 hectares. 
This is a 14 hectare cucumber crop in, in Holland. This guy was owned, this whole farm was owned by a 24 year old. Young guy, 14 hectares. The dream. <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference between a low tech and a high tech glass house operation? One is very high gutter heights, much, much higher gutter heights. This one's in home Impro the, the improvement center in, in Holland. This glass house is eight meters to the gutter. Whereas mine's five, which means the temperatures, there's much less um, change because there's such a huge buffer between the top of the canopy, canopy and the roof. Of advanced, advanced climate control systems, heating systems, cooling systems. This is a rose grower in Holland. They have hundreds of these little cooling pads all over. The infrastructure alone at this place is phenomenal. Just for roses. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and shade screens, which means if it gets too hot, they can just cover it over so the, the canopy, the crop, just gets protected from the sun. So, for example, I, I'm using the example of one hectare, which is pretty much um, standard in the Virginia area. A one hectare low tech greenhouse can be converted for $150,000 Australia, whereas a one, high, one hectare high tech is $2 million. It's a massive difference. Why should you do the high tech when the low tech, it's basically real cheap. One, you can harvest much sooner in a high tech. We get our plants pretty much like this now. We don't get them as little small seedlings anymore. They're almost flowering when we're planting already, which means we can cut two to three weeks off the Production. Oh, we can pr produce two to three weeks earlier. It will, and us, we don't have to get our hands in the soil anymore. We just <laughs> get them like this and chuck them straight on. <laughs> um, hydroponics versus salt, we harvest sooner. The, it's a much longer season. So instead of three month seedling, three month harvest, it's three month seedling, nine months of harvest. Which means a crop is one year. We can get 25 to 35 of these trusses instead of 10 to 15 per year in the soil. A typical um, soil growing tomato plant lasts, goes up to about 3 meters. In ours, it can go up to 15 by the end of the crop. We can recirculate our water in hydroponics. You can see at the end of the gully, it just drops down. We can collect that water. 40% water saving, 60% fertilizer saving. In a typical <coughs> one hectare greenhouse, thirty-seven thousand dollars we can save. Just go straight up. <laughs> <laughs> and from the, from the number one important factor for us, we get out of that old old soil. Every year we start new again. I just like to talk about a bit about salinity for Brad. For us, sometimes we like salinity. Um, salinity. As you know, the salty that sometimes for tomatoes, it makes tomatoes look much nicer, much firmer. So we can make it very, uh, very salty, but then we can push it back. When the plant, when the tomato plant sees high salinity levels, it thinks it's dying. So that it will generate, it will make more fruit, more seeds to pass on its generation because of, because of that, yeah, that, that uh, push of death. But then we can give it that, that push, but then we can bring it back. <laughs> so basically, yes, we're trying to kill it and then we're trying to give it life. <laughs> so that's how we make our money, that's how we get such a long season. We push it, we bring it back, push it, bring it back, all year long. All year long. But that's the control we get. So what are the returns? On a low-tech greenhouse, it costs $150,000. On a high-tech, $2 million. A low-tech greenhouse can yield 30 kilograms a square meter. That's what we typically get in this area. Whereas a, a high tech, it starts at 60, 60 kilograms a square meter double. In Europe now, they're getting 80, 80 kilograms a square meter. In America, one greenhouse recently got 98 kilograms a square meter. I'm typically around the 45, 50. Uh, if I was getting 60, I'd uh, a Ferrari straight away. <laughs> 60 is just phenomenal numbers for me, but to get 80, 98 kilograms a square meter, that, that's the dream for real. One hectare, the typical price of tomatoes over the last three years has been two, two kilograms a square meter, which 
would net return about 600,000. One hectare, two kilograms is 1.2, which means the same net income, 30%, $180,000 for, for, for a small family business. It's a huge, it's massive. Whereas net for a high-tech greenhouse is about 25% because of high operational costs, $300,000, still very, very good returns. Therefore, as I was saying before, farming is no longer a lifestyle, it's become a business. Because you have so much to lose. Um, if, you're, if you're harvesting for nine months of the year and you screw up two months in like we have before, <laughs> you, you stand to lose a lot of money. You stand to lose a lot of money. You, um, starting again, it's a big process to start your season over again. So, the difference between low tech and high tech greenhouses, it's a struggle to maintain quality in these low tech greenhouses because of the climates that we have. It's a higher chances of mistakes in these, in these low tech. One is because usually they use cheaper equipment, they're more prone to mistakes, to damage. In a high tech, more uniform climate, we can produce the same quality produce all year round, which is what the supermarkets want, which is what they demand. Same as the customer, except when the prices are really high, and they'll just take crap. Maybe it's much easier to find. In these high-tech greenhouses, in my, high, in my greenhouse, I basically don't have to walk. The trolleys do everything for me. Limitations for the industry, Virginia, rapidly aging. My father, if I didn't come back, my father would, he would not be um, growing anymore. They're hitting 60, 65 year old, um, years, and they don't want to farm in the soil anymore. Probably from the children. They're much more smarter than me. They, they're, oh, <laughs> they're not farmers anymore. Huge capital costs. It, Two million dollars for greenhouse is just nothing. This is just something that immigrant families will not go to the bank and say, can I have two million dollars please? I want to build a greenhouse. So I'll tell you where to go. <laughs> Infrastructure. In this area, our, our farm has no gas line. Some farms have no town water. Um, and council restrictions in this area means sometimes it's very hard to build these greenhouses. In Holland, for example, greenhouses, those glass houses, are becoming energy producers. So instead of using energy, they'll create energy and they'll, they'll power, for example, um, homes, businesses next to them. So it's a big difference. I heard a story that there was once a pipeline under Holland that ran, um, I think it ran oil under Holland. And when they decided to finish that, that project, they cleaned this pipeline out and they ran CO2 through it and just gave it pretty much cheaply to these growers if I can't even get CO2. CO2 adds 30% production to a greenhouse and when you can have that system in place, it's just phenomenal. Um, land prices are skyrocketing because of urban encroachment. Um, for example, down the road from my house, there's plenty of houses around. Um, soon, soon, I think. Um, we applied to build one of these glass houses, but the council won't let us because they say in 20 years there might be homes around us. So that's why we built ourselves. So, yeah. But I, I still think there will always be a market for soil and field crops. Um, hydroponic to, um, produce is the, real, the top end of the market because our costs are so high. <laughs> Therefore, People are always really going to find a cheap, or naturally, find a cheap alternative. So that's therefore soil and field crops. Um, I quite like when the prices drop, like they have in Europe, because it gives people a chance to uh, afford our, 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 our produce. And we can pass it through much easier. Um, some recommendations for the industry, I believe. Recycling wastewater to be mandatory. Um, I think the EPA is starting to clamp down on this because there's such a huge boom in the amount of farms that have been converted over. Um, I just, I, yeah, basically I just want all water to be collected, recycled. Integrated pest management programs to be subsidized like they do in Spain. IPM is basically adding insects into a greenhouse to eat other insects. At the moment, it's, it's kind of hard to introduce this into into Australia, one is um, chemical uses rampant for the industry. 
Um, the other one is expensive. And the third one, that's a very important one that I keep telling Ben about, we need bumblebees. We really, really need bumblebees because please give us bumblebees. <laughs> if bumblebees were to, re to be released into these greenhouses, I think chemical usage would drop by at least half overnight because you can't spray for using bumblebees. The only issue is the none on the mainland. And the native bumblebees are solitary and yeah, they, they, they won't work. I've done a trial with honeybees, but it, it didn't work. They tried killing each other. <laughs> yeah, apparently they use sunlight to for guidance and in the greenhouse they can't see it. Yeah, and all that they just crash their heads against the <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, it. And one is very important is tomato levies to be introduced for greenhouse tomatoes. Um, at the moment there's no R and D, no research and development for tomatoes. <coughs> Um, if I need to spray for a disease, there's only one or two. It's only been one or two for 10 years. And because there's um, not a lot of, uh, I should say, uh, councils and people watching the area, we're pretty much free to do what we want. <laughs> so, yeah, just, to be honest, just be careful. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to, to be fair, um, Fresh care. We have fresh care for the supermarkets. We must have fresh care. But for fresh care, we get MRO. We get our fruit tested once a year. But how is that going to help when if I can just set my fruit in before I harvest? If I haven't sprayed for five weeks, and I should go get my fruit tested. And that test lasts me for a whole year. It's not really, you know, it doesn't really help grow. So I've started to, we started some industry groups which will have a level higher than fresh care for the real, to the top end of the, the growers in Australia, really. This is what happens to a tomato plant at 21 degrees when it hasn't been watered for only one day. My brother did it while I was on my slow <laughs> 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 so I remember, um, because my, my farm is linked to my, at, the, at that time, my iPhone, I can see what's happening. <laughs> All the data, and I saw um, the EC, the irrigation, just spike up and down all day. But I was stupid and didn't ask him. He cleaned the filters, but he didn't turn the valve back on. <laughs> just one single mistake caused that. Caused a lot, a lot of damage. A lot of damage. Uh, I'd like to thank my family for allowing me to go, apart from my brother. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank my global focus program. It was a massive massive change in my life. I had such fun, a lot of fun on the World Focus program. And lastly, I'd like to thank Andrew Johnson. Is he still here? Andrew Johnson. Yeah, he, he was the one who actually pushed me into the, the Nafu. I was, at that time, a little lazy. <laughs> he gave it to me. That's why I'm, I'm on this program now. Yes, Hill, Mark Monterey. Just a very entertaining, thank you. Uh, some comments in regards to the supply chain. Uh, you're probably aware of the uh, uh, media's comment on the job that we have with the Colin Woolies in Australia. Yeah. Would you like to comment on that from your perspective and perhaps in relation to what you've seen overseas in okay. regards to that yeah. marketing chain? So basically for the last, so ever since I've started the last four years, tomato prices are very volatile and that they should be, I believe they should be. Supply, it's just basically supply and demand. This year, um, I think Woolworths set the price of trust tomatoes at $4.95, which is it's a good and bad thing in a way. They knew after the floods in, in Queensland, after what's happening all around Australia, the price of the tomatoes would skyrocket about this time. They were very smart about it. They came to me three months before I had even started harvesting and asked me if I wanted to sign a contract for $3 a kilogram, all year round. And I, basically, I told them where to go. I said, no, I, I do, I'd rather do the, the market, market prices. In the first two months, three months, I got $6 a kilogram for my tomatoes. Yeah, so thanks for that. Um, yeah, high foods. <laughs> <Love it. laughs> uh, at the moment, tomato prices are still $5 a kilogram. They were offering me three. I would have lost so much money. But what's, I don't know how they, and figure out these prices, but uh, and prices are still 
495 at, at Woolworths. I, so that I can't see how they're making money off that. But I guess it's a good way because the people are starting to buy trust miles. And there's a shift from, say, when people go and buy cheap field, I'm sorry, cheap field and soil, they, they'll try trust and hopefully they'll, they'll continue with trust miles. Overseas, I've noticed, um, especially in, in Europe, they'll get paid at the market, at the supermarket level, it's about $2 a euro per kilogram. And that's what it's been. It's what it is all the time. If that was to happen in Australia, I think a lot of people go broke. We can't afford that. In Europe, instead of people that, um, fighting against it, what did they do? They invested more money, more money into this industry because they can save money. Any, anything you don't, we can never control, as I tell people, you can never control the price of what you're getting paid. Especially because our um, produce users <coughs> call your woolies, but you can control your costs. The lower you can, the lower cost you can get it to, the more money in your pocket. But basically, that's all we can we can do. We're, we're very small problems. Very small problems. Yeah. Uh, nice presentation. Uh, my my question: What is your future plans? My future plans. Um, I have no more land, as you can see. Um, <laughs> I would like my my future. Future plans is to build a, at least a two hectare international grade um, greenhouse. But for me to do that, I have to go to the bank. And give me five million, five million dollars, and I, I just can't see that happening. Yeah, it's, for me, it's still something I love doing. It's a lifestyle, and it's business. It's still not together. If I were to go to the bank and get a big loan, then I'd have to run it solely as a business, and there's the added stress that I just don't want. Uh, Mark Spoof, just curious on your, as your thoughts on aquaponics and its future, what you saw while you were in it. Yeah. Um, yeah, aquaponics. I've seen um, in Holland there's lots and lots of trials. I've seen one greenhouse, one trial demonstration greenhouse. They did 100 kilograms per square meter, but you can't really use those. Demonstration because they're very small plots and it doesn't really equate to commercialized um, greenhouses. Aquaponics, um, it has a, a future um, more for small growers, hobby, hobby farmers can use aqu aquaponics. Um, it's kind of hard because <coughs> hydroponics, it's um, all about the data, it's all about control, and it's all about um, limiting uh, growth and you know, putting back and forth, back and forth. Whereas in, in aquaponics, there's so many variables, you can't really get, for example, um, I can't see myself getting, say, 60 kilograms a square meter with aquaponics. Yeah, it's, it's such a new industry, whereas this has been around since the 70s. Sorry, can you describe, I don't know, what's the difference between hydroponics and aquaponics? Oh, aquaponics is basically the water that is being um, fed through to the, the plants. It's from, <coughs> basically from um, tanks of fish. Um, and anyone who has, uh, has a fish tank at home, Knows you have this cycle before you add fish in, which means there's beneficial bacteria in that water, which kind of kill the I think it's nitrates in that water and converts them to well basically um oh good bacteria I forgot the name but basically that good bacteria is what's feeding the plants. It's kind of like um, Brad's example of the biologicals. I use biologicals on my farm. I use trichodermas and things like that. It's just adding um, a layer. To say for them to the, the root system, which helps in nutrient um, uptake, which is also what um, the organic industry is about, because there's really no substitute for say calcium nitrate, potassium nitrate, in, in, for organics. So they'll use these benef beneficial bacteria to increase the uptake of calcium and potassium. That's the difference between say organics and hydroponics is that we use soluble synthetic um, fertilizers. Okay, just one last question. Yeah, just um, you made a comment on your future plans, and you and you said you don't have any more land. Yeah. Is is your proximity to markets the thing that's stopping you from actually selling your dirt in Virginia, which is obviously worth a lot of money, and going to a a region where you don't have to pay very much at all for soil, and and actually build your concrete on top of that? Yeah, exactly. That's one benefit um, that Virginia has had because everyone's so close similar to Holland or America in Spain. Everyone's so close that the industry is being built around us. If I have to buy cardins, they've had to buy fertilizers, chemicals, I don't have to travel 50 k's 
they don't have to travel 50 k's to meet and just go down the road. That's, that's the kind of the advantage that we have. If I was to move 50 kilometers out and I need trains, they'd have to get a whole semi load to me just to make it worth it, worth my while. If I needed fertilizer, they'd have to send containers out to me, which just makes it very, very difficult and expensive. And one is um, after three years of building, non-stop, seven, from seven to seven, seven days a week, um, I'm kind of sick and tired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't want to build anymore. Oh, that's fantastic. If uh, Terry brings the light up.